This is Off-Planet Radio. This is Off-Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. Welcome to the show. Um, something a bit different as we launch into the year 2020. <laughs> the eye of the needle. Yeah. Um, some very interesting things going on. And I'm told this is, um, as we're sitting here straddling two, two divides of the continental timelines, that uh, it is Chinese New Year, the year of the rat. And uh, my guests will explain that. Uh, joining me from, I believe, the east coast of Australia is my guest today, Munya Ann Andrews, who's uh, an indigenous woman from Kimberley region of Western Australia and born to an Aboriginal mother and Scottish father. Um, she is uh, proud of both her Aboriginal and Celtic or heritage, and we'll talk about that because that's an interesting blend as well. Her Barty saltwater people come from the Dampier Peninsula and offshore islands of Broome. And um, growing up, she had a lot of, um, well, a lot of difficulty, as a lot of us do, and uh, as, as a result of those things and coming through them, she has become um, a strong advocate of personal responsibility and encourages people to make a real difference in their lives by creating lasting changes so they are healthy and whole. We all want that. We all strive for that. Manya Andrews, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Oh, thanks for having me, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been following you for a number of years and listening to Off Planet Radio. You and um, and uh, yeah, just really love the show um, with Emily as well. Um, and uh, I feel that we're a kindred kindred souls, really, because a lot of the things that you talk about really resonates with me. And one of the biggest ones of of, of that, one, of course, is personal empowerment um uh so uh and people getting through the hard times uh with our spirituality to to guide us yeah i mean we we all have, seem to have these backgrounds that include a fair amount of early life trauma and that uh, that almost to me feels like uh, an earmark of somebody who's marked for spiritual destiny in some way and i know that's part of your background as well Tell us a little bit about your early life and, and how you came into your calling and your understanding of who you are. Um, yeah, well, I grew up, um, I guess what Americans would call the outback, um, out in the bush, away from the urban uh, centers and cities. Um, uh, grew up in um, pretty much a traditional lifestyle with my people, my Aboriginal uh, people, um, very connected to my indigeneity um, and, um, and uh, Aboriginal spirituality, of, of course. And um, a, a, lot, a lot Aboriginal people are very similar to Native Americans. We have a very similar sort of history, but also our, our culture and spirituality um, is the same. So we've gone through that whole, um, you know, experience of having um, our children removed and taken from their families, placed in in uh, boarding schools um, to almost de-Aboriginalise people. Um, and I think that's aimed at um, making people forget who they are, forgetting their identity and what gives them strength so that they're better able to manipulate and, and destroy people's souls and cause damage on that level. So I grew up um, with a very strong um, Aboriginal background and had a very strong Aboriginal grandmother who passed on a, a lot of Aboriginal heritage to me. And so that's guided me through the years. Of course, a lot of our, our people um, have problems um, uh, uh, finding their way in the world, as everyone else does. Um, 
but um, for me, it's all about um, uh, my indigeneity that gives me that inner strength and purpose to keep living really in the face of adversity, if you like. Um, so uh, in that way, I'm lucky to have been exposed to my culture because a lot of um, our people that were taken away, we call them the the stolen generation here in Australia, um, have lost that uh, lost that background and that, that gives them purpose and strength. So um, I'm very lucky in that regard that that's still very strong with me and my family. You know, when you're talking about this and I'm thinking about how we've been we've been cut off in so many ways from our source one of them being the ties to our bloodlines our 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 ancestral traditions our ancestral even the knowledge of it i mean i'm of european descent but beyond that really i don't have a lot of connection going back to anything that would be considered um, connected to lands and bloodlines because of the dilution that occurred, uh, people migrating and settling mm. into a place like the United States. And, and this was all the effects of, of uh, the colonialization of, of, of empire, which was basically displacing Aboriginal native peoples and migrating other people into uh, land masses where they were not indigenous. So we've lost a connection to our bloodlines and a connection to the lands that we were once tied through through our ancestral heritage. And I don't think it's lost on me that there was a plan here because as I, mm. as I went through your book, uh, I was struck by how many times I saw the connections between the bloodlines and um, the heritage and the connection to land and how sacred that really is. Absolutely, and it's all about our connection with, with nature. And um, and nature is a great strength for human beings. And of course, you know, the powers that be are all about taking people away from that, removing them from connecting with nature. Um, uh, and, and it's all really about um, getting us to forget who we really are so that we're better able to be manipulated and um, and so forth. So, mm. so how did you, um, you again? You have this 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 background that's again sort of mixed because you have Scottish Celtic blood, which is yes. a very interesting mixture that seems to show up um, over the years. And people I've talked to who have here Native American ties and a mixture of Celtic bloodlines. And that seems to be, uh, I know, for instance, um, Duncan O'Finian, who I interviewed many times over the years, told me that he was profiled for MK Ultra as a result of both his Native American background and his Celtic background as well. So wow. they, they profile according to bloodlines and heritages in ways that are interesting because those particular bloodlines hold connections even etherically to the mystical practices that I think they're trying to wipe out, but at the same time, it feels like they also want to somehow commandeer those gifts and, and callings. I think so. And I think it is um, also about ex exploitation and um, taking that background and, and exploiting us in, in that way. So um yeah it's just it's just crazy isn't it um a, a lot of um aboriginal people here do have that um mixed uh blood from that colonial heritage and it's something that um a lot of us have to work through i um um for a long time i feel a very strong connection to both uh, cultural heritage and i see them both as uh cultural strengths if you like um so, mm, um, yeah. the Celt culture as well is kind yeah. of um, blotted out and blurred in history. We don't know a lot about it. Um, the more I've studied it over the years, the more it looks like this was probably the earliest roots of um, what we would call the European leg of post-Roman Empire and also probably the closest to an authentically grounded 
spiritual people occupying that part of the European continents. And in that, there is a loss again of connection. How did you get how did you get to the place where you understood who you were? Did that come as a child? Did it come later? Were, were you trained as a child? Yeah, it, it came very much um, as a child and um, just being, uh, again, having a very strong um, ab Aboriginal heritage. Um, it came through there. But I remember, um, you know, I, I believe in, in past lives as well. So Absolutely. I remember. I remember walking through the bush and my, for some odd reason, my mother was talking to me about Atlantis, the, the issue of Atlantis came up. And as a little kid, I, re, I, I remembered and I thought, yeah, well, you're not telling me anything new. And I think that that comes from my European heritage, that um, also that connection to a Atlantis as well. So just as a young child being um, very different, I suppose, um, I, I didn't speak for the first five years of my life, which some people find um, very interesting and quite often uh, with people uh, like myself like that, that's because we do have that, um, we live very much in that spiritual world and, um, uh, you know, I've seen a, be, being different um, to, to um, people. So it was something that was always there. And one of the good things, is, and I grew up in a time of uh, a lot of racism in Australia and you're being told, look, as an Aboriginal person, you're of no value or worth. And I just remember thinking as a child, um, well, that's a lot of crap and that's a lot of bullshit. I'm not going to listen to that. And I don't believe you. Um, which um, so it's it's something that's always been with me as um, just uh, that inner strength of of not believing what others tell me about myself, which of course is um, what it's all about, isn't it? The way that um, young people or, or people in general are told you're of no value or or um, you're this or you're that, and for me it was always just staying strong in myself and not believing what I'm told, going uh, against um, the the dominant uh, society, if you like. Um, so um, uh, what what you chalk that up to, I don't know, but for me it's about just that inner, inner strength and inner spirit. It's so interesting that you bring up Atlantis. Um, I think a lot of us have connections to both Atlantis and Lemuria, because mm. I, I remember having these memories when I was a child. And then when I was a teenager, I started to research and read about both Atlantis and, and Lemuria and, and had this, in, this incredible sense of longing and loss about the, the sense that there was a, a, a world, a land that no longer existed. And what that what that meant and how I felt connected to it. And, you know, over the years, I noticed that that comes up with with especially very spiritually connected people that this is just kind of maybe the sense that we came back here from another civilization to this one at a time when this civilization is kind of heading maybe towards the same fate that those two civilizations suffered. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. And um, I don't know if you remember, Randy, but I mean, I lived in the States um, around 1977, 78, mm -hmm. went to high school then. But there was a television series, The Man from Atlantis, starring Patrick Duffy. It was, and, yes. Yeah, oh, my. Did that did that grab my imagination, you know, that he could swim underwater and, and uh, go down and visit his homes and that. So I've always had that connection with water um, um, and just that, as you say, that, that I had a, a very strong sense of um, people doing the wrong thing way back then. And I, I, I do find, um, I, look, I, I look around today and think, geez, the world's gone mad. You know, what, what's wrong with it? And um, back then, uh, it's interesting, a clairvoyant said, um, told me, um, yes, when you lived there, you were a clairvoyant and you could see what was coming and you tried to warn the people, but the people wouldn't listen. And so that's why you've turned your back a little on on that in this lifetime. But I do have this sense of we've just got to wake up and, and do something or, or we're heading down that same destructive path. Um, 
uh, of of what happened uh, in in Atlantis, and it and it starts with messing with people's minds and um, an identity, and um, uh, you know, it, it it's a really worrying trend. And um, yeah, sometimes I just feel quite uh, desperate in, in terms of trying to wake people up. I know you've been doing that for a long time, um, but uh, yeah, it is that we we seem to just uh, know of another way of being and know that this there's something very strange with this world, uh, this construct that we live in. So mm. it's interesting. We could do a whole. We could do a whole riff on on the water thing because, you know, when, now that now that you triggered that memory, I don't think I've thought about that 1977 uh, Atlantis series f f forever. But now that you triggered that memory, it, it plays into so many of the memes that we talk about on the show, including these these water portals and this connection to water and, you know the idea that water is possibly the gateway into what we think is space and how that all plays out in, you know, even the imagery of our connection back to elements again. I mean, all mm -hmm. all of the four primary elements are yeah. really important and, and we'll kind of unpack this as we go. But that, that memory, that, that picture, there was something going on at that period of time in the 70s. I, I was... <laughs> Um, a little bit older than you, so I was I was out of my teens at that point. But um, that particular era was kind of the distant drums, I would say, of where we're at now. When I think about it, even in terms of entertainment, they were putting a lot of things out in that that period of time that I think were trial balloons, maybe to see if they could psychically mm -hmm. magnetize us in some way. See, well, let's see mm -hmm. if we can get their interest here fascinating yeah. stuff yeah definitely and um and uh, that connection with water is still there for me you know i saw the recent aquaman of course and yes um <laughs> you know and the, and the thing is um I, I have memories of living in water and i've always said to people um if i if it were possible for me to go and live in the ocean today right now i would go and um and i think that that harkens back somewhere to this distant past or the memory of, of that of being underwater and um being very comfortable in water as well so yeah <laughs> so as a child you had this sense you also had uh an indigenous grandmother who was an influence talk to me a little bit about that um she yes she taught me a lot of dreamtime stories. It's where I first learned about a lot of dreamtime stories. The other um, interesting thing about that is um, I, I wrote a book um, called The Seven Sisters of the Pleiades because the um, seven sisters are very uh, strong in our mythology and um, uh, in particular my grandmother would take me out to look at the stars and point to the, the girls in the sky and say, there they are, there's your relatives. And she always maintained that we come from them. And so I would go out at night and wave to the stars, to, to the, 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 the stars of the Pleiades in particular, and um, uh, however you pronounce that, um, and yeah, wave and, and say hi. And, but, and they felt like family um, to me. So always having that connection, that very deep connection to the stars and um, but just to culture as well and spending time in the bush I, I was a very um, I, I had a very good imagination as a child and uh, loved spending time in the bush and um, you know having um, a lot of creative fantasies that you play out as you're playing around and whatnot but um, it's so for me it started uh, very early as, as a young child being out in the bush being told stories um, and mixing with um, my Aboriginal people. So, yeah. That's interesting. Again, more connections. This mm. strong connection to the natural world. I was, I live in what's southern Pennsylvania, which is in the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, as a child, I grew up in a very rural place. My, my maternal grandparents owned a, a very large farm. And I spent a lot of time on that farm, and I spent a lot of time in the woods, in the mountains, and in streams. And 
I've talked about this before, how I had these connections with the elementals, the, 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 the nature sprites, the beings that live in water and live in the greenery around us, and how that connection was, it was, it was telepathic. I mean, you sensed them, they were there, and they were undisturbed. This was land then that was largely undisturbed probably thousands of years. I mean, it was pristine. And those things existed in this, in this space that um, if left undisturbed, nature sort of created this interesting gateway into the supernatural realm as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're, we're taught from a very young age to be very respectful um, of the bush. Um, and to some extent, too, people, as we grow up, we are scared of the bush because it, it is that portal to uh, and other worlds. And there have been stories that Aboriginal people have told of walking in the bush, if you like, and almost entering another dimension um, and, and getting lost. So when we well, when we explain people getting lost, this is um, Indigenous people, um, quite often it's, it's uh, I've had Aboriginal people say to me, they've been walking out in the bush and all of a sudden the environment has, has changed and so it's unrecognisable and that's why they get lost. So it's it, it's almost as if they they do enter those different portals and enter different dimensions. And people have said they've stepped off and gone somewhere, didn't know where they had gone, and then come back. So, um, so you're told to to be careful when you're walking in in the bush as well. Yeah, uh, I I believe very strongly based on even my own experiences that uh, there's dimensional gateways there that you can literally step across what's probably a, a very large expanse if you could calculate it in terms of miles or kilometers but you wind up in another place another realm um in that sense there's a there's an atmosphere to it there's a sense that something shifted something changed and you you know to quote wizard of oz we're not in kansas right now <laughs> that's right yeah for sure <laughs> So immersion into the natural world, um, when did you begin to, first off, maybe we should explain shamanism and dream time. Mm -hmm. That would probably inform the conversation going forward because I, I discovered reading your book that I didn't really completely understand dream time the same way as you were talking about it. I mean, we have... Mm -hmm. What we call dream time a lot of times is our is our sleep cycles and maybe that period where we remember going into dream. For me, dream world is like my native landscape. But talk to me a little bit about what dream time actually is in terms of the working of the Aboriginal, for lack of a better word, process. Mm, I yeah, so it's 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 dream time is um, uh, all time and then no time. So it's the past, present, and future all combined in into one, um, so that you're able to access these the different time periods, if you like. It's also about that creative period in in our history when the spiritual ancestors in this country walked across the continent and named places and and created certain uh, ceremonies and and stories and, and like like that so it's about it's it's about entering um that world of those spirit beings and being in touch with those creative uh, elements if you like the with um creation it, itself and um so um as the ancestors walked across the country they left they deposited if you like energy into um, different parts of the country so the ones that come behind like myself those living today um the idea is that you can connect with those with with those past creative ancestors through the spiritual essence that they leave in the land um, and so that gives the idea of sacred sites 
Um, all of the land is sacred, of course, we're taught, but sacred sites are special because they're almost like <clears throat> they're the concentrated uh, places where the energy is really, really concentrated. And um, there's uh, all sorts of, um, the, it's very powerful. It can overwhelm you um, emotionally, um, mentally, and, and, and so forth. But <clears throat> so it's a creative time. Um, but it's also reminding us that we are creative beings as well, and so that we can play just as active a role as those creative ancestors did in the past. So through our ceremonies and our songs and our chants and that, it's about connecting back to those uh, spiritual ancestors who are our relatives, uh, uh, um, uh, whether they be animal or human, because Dreamtime teaches that at one stage um, uh, we were we were we were kangaroo and possum before we were human, and and uh, so that's about connecting at a very deep uh, level with the natural world. Um, so it's all about teaching us respect for those beings and and for creation, if you like. So um, you know to. To go about bombing the place, uh, the country, and that is uh, would 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 be a sin in in our eyes because that's um, doing the wrong thing by those creative uh, ancestral beings. But at the same time, acknowledging that that they're all powerful and and um, yeah uh, can teach us about power, if you like. So it's a it is a very different way of viewing the world, and a lot of people have difficulty dreams your natural dreams that you have at night and that are a part of that dream time world as well but dream time isn't just about mentally um dreaming um but your dreams can inform you and in fact a lot of our shamans if you like um will go on these adventures at night or elsewhere either with the assistance of drugs or not and will enter these different realms and they'll come back and share their dreams um, with the tribe um, and tell us what they experienced um, along the way. So um, you mentioned drugs there. So yeah. uh, largely meaning natural like in theogenics. Um, yeah. yeah. Talk a little like, bit about that. That's not something I knew. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there are some of the shamans that will use some of the the natural um, mm. drugs, um, plant based, um, which I suppose is like ayahuasca in okay. um, yeah. in South American culture. We call it um, pituri, um, and it's used mainly by just by the shamans um, in terms of guiding them on their spiritual journeys. So, in Entering into dream time, um, is the, I, what what is the invocation for this? Is this do you have you have ceremonies obviously? So going into dream time, let's say in a group, is this something that you do as part of a ritual, and then there is sort of an entering into or a crossing over? Um, there can be yes, and. Um, so, for instance, people that are dancing together and they may be telling a story in the dance, but um, very often people, even as a group, will have that collective experience, if you like, of of being a kangaroo, for instance, and then crossing over into that dimension and taking on the physical aspects of the kangaroo and in the, in their body bodily movements, um, and you can you can see when people are dancing that some of them do enter that almost um, altered state, if you like, um, and and once again of communi communing with the these animals, for instance, and feeling a very deep and personal connection with them. Um, so yeah, you so you can do it as a group, but also on an individual basis. Um, uh, and have your own personal experience of that. Um, but it is all always about um, just having this other experience. Quite often, for instance, when I'm walking uh, through the bush, I spend a lot of time in the bush. Um, there have been times when I've spotted a kangaroo way off in the distance um, and feeling very in tune with that animal, um, looking at it and almost... Uh, 
seeing that it's looking back at me and spying each other and just feeling a very deep connection um, with them and and to the natural world. Yeah, that that kind of goes into, um, I guess, totems and animal spirits as well. Um, Yes. What is your understanding about, like, personal totems and how we maybe identify with specific animals in terms of even understanding our own place in the order of the natural world or our destiny, our mission? Yeah. um, So the way that um, when I'm talking to people about totems, I always say sometimes um, can you think of a particular connection that you have with a particular animal? Have you noticed, for instance, when you're out walking that um, perhaps um, there's a a certain bird that's always about um, or a certain animal? And people go, yes, now that you mention it, um, yes, I've noticed that when I go walking, there's a magpie, um, which is a bird um, that's that's always around, always watching me. And, I, and I'd say, well, that's your totem, that's your dreaming. Um, and I often lead meditations for people to help them discover what their totems are. Um, we, we also use the term dreaming to explain that. So my dreamings, for instance, um, uh, is the eagle, the, the sea, sea eagle, the white-chested mm. sea eagle, and also the, the bat we call Nimanbor. And um, that's a good one. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what it is is with these animals, um, uh, um, the idea of having a totem is that it's, it is, uh, it, they they tell you what your purpose is in life and what your strengths and your weaknesses are going to be. So you get in touch with that animal and you go, right, so wh- what do bats have that um, gives them strengths? Um, one, they hang upside down, and, and when they do that, you they have new perspective of seeing the world and so forth. And I think to myself, yeah, that's what I do. And, in fact, when I'm stuck with a problem that I need to solve, I actually lie on the bed and literally hang upside down and I'm able to see solutions that I wouldn't otherwise if I was standing upright, for for example. Um, Bats have exceptionally good, it's not so much hearing, but sonic hearing using sonar. Mm -hmm. So, Um, so, yeah, so it teaches me that ability to to use my own sonar once again to be guided um, in the dark. And, and so forth. So the, having a totem is about connecting um, with um, those animals and, and the strengths that lie within you as, as a human being. Um, they're there to teach us um, our, our path in life, if you like, and, um, and say, hello, here I am, and I'm here to guide you. And this is the way that I can guide you. It's interesting because the eagle and the bat are both creatures that can fly and i fly a lot in my dreams i have mm, dreams yeah i'm flying yeah, yeah i've Just talked about there. this before the flying yeah. dreams are amazing yeah and i'm not then again i'm not surprised because of my dreamings um i've got two that are there and um eagles um can fly very high in the air and they they have that ability to see the overall lie of the land um but if they want to hone in and spot their um, prey down on the ground they can do that so eagle people for instance have that um, vision um wider vision that a lot of people don't but when they can come in at the same time and hone in on exact details when it's needed so it's a great it's a very um useful dreaming to to have because it gives me those skills and i can see in my life um where i use that um ability all the time to do that um so yeah so they're about your strengths and 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 your guides in life and your purpose have you are you familiar with um, Carlos Castaneda? Yes, I read the teaching I've of read Don, the... Don Juan because yes. Castaneda writes in, in one of the early books on Don Juan how he goes out into the desert and obviously they're using the peyote and at one point he is able to cast his mind into a bird that's flying and literally possess the vision of this bird. I don't remember the bird now, mm-hmm. but 
it to me when I was reading this book and I was probably about 16 or 17 years old for a long time I fixated on that as just the most amazing concept of being able to put your mind into the mind of an animal and inhabit the senses because you know these humans were supposedly the dominant species on the on the world but these animals i mean no human can soar like an eagle or a hawk and be able to gain that that panoramic view and yet at the same time like an eagle be able to spot a mouse on the ground from from 2000 feet or however high up they are it's it's phenomenal and i just remember grabbing a hold of this and thinking yeah this is part of the mind of nature that we need to be able to access absolutely and and it does help you to see and to spy on your enemies if you like yes. to always see the enemy coming and approaching because um, when some people think they can get it over me it's like you have no idea i can fly in the sky and and see you and i guess um, that's kind of connected to remote viewing. Mm, um, yeah. I, I had a, my first experience of remote viewing when I was about 11 or 12 years old. <clears throat> and I was talking to a friend and she said, um, uh, can you just wait? I, I need to go and just see my boyfriend uh, for a few minutes. There was a house further down the road. And I said, no problem, you go off and do that. And when she did, um, it was almost like I followed her as an eagle. I saw her go into the house. I saw her have the conversation with the brother, uh, the boyfriend. I heard everything she said. And when she came back, <clears throat> I told her what I'd experienced. And she was just amazed. And she said, how did you know that? And I said, I, I, I flew like an eagle and, and followed you and saw you. So I, that's that remote viewing. When I read about remote viewing, I thought, I can do that. You know, I've had that experience. I know what that's like. So, again, it's about um, um, us realizing we have those skills within us and we're able to access um, those worlds, if you like. When you were talking earlier about dream time, you, you talked about um, dream time as no time. And that's an interesting space as well. I mean, I think a lot of us have experienced that. Everybody has experienced it, whether they acknowledge it or not. But I've had profound sense of um, time distortions, time dilation, time where literally time stopped or time moved in very interesting ways. And you um, in your book, I, I pulled this quote because this was so interesting to me. I didn't know this. You uh, you quote um, Carlo Rovelli, who's a theoretical physicist and wrote this book, The Order of Time. And he concludes in that book, the mystery of time is more about ourselves than about the cosmos, which is interesting because I think the cosmos is both within us and without us. And in fact, that's the entire tagline to this show is basically we are the cosmos. We are universe experiencing itself. But this idea that the mystery of time is more about ourselves than about the cosmos in the sense of what I've said a number of times is that I believe we generate time fields and then occupy them in dream time. Do do you get the sense that that time suspends and then moves in some way? Is there something about being outside of time that then allows us to have a different sense about who we are relative to it? Um, That's a loaded so. question, by the way. I'm yeah. sorry. It's a horrible question. <laughs> No, I, I, th I think that, that, that that's true, that it does teach us that um, we, we can sort of almost be the observer and stand outside and, and, and look back. But the other interesting thing about this whole issue of time and, um, you know, quantum physics and uh, yeah, quantum computing is, you know, um, Western scientists realizing that um, time changes depending on, on who's perceiving timing, who, who's looking back at time, that it can almost change time through our observation, if you like. And so that fits in to me very much with creation, and that's why um, 
I, I say that Dreamtime allows us to be able to um, access that creative space where we can play a part in creation. So in our culture, for instance, we sing for land, we sing for country, we sing, we sing for land to stand up um, brand new. So what that teaches us is that we can play a part in that creative process of um, creating and maintaining the world, if you like. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Randy, you're aware we've had, we've just had a unprecedented bushfires in, in yeah, Australia yeah. Um, around this time, and of course, what that's done is damaged a lot of the country, and so a lot of our people are feeling sorrowful and and sorrow uh, for a lot of the damage that's done. But the exciting thing about that, on the other hand, is that we can actually get in and sing the country back and restore the country back and be involved in that creation. And I think that 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 um, dream time um, yeah, teaches us and gives us that ability to stand outside of time and to, um, yeah, to, to mould our world, if you like, um, which is a very powerful uh, way of engaging with the universe and with the world. Uh, and, and in a very different, different way. Yeah, I know these fires, and we have them here on the in, in the western part of the United States. And obviously, a lot of you know paranoia and suspicion that a lot of these fires are not, let's just say, of a natural origin. And I don't disagree with that. I don't know what what people in Australia are sensing about the massive level of fires that you experience there. Um, what, what, what is the sentiment? What do you think about the origin of these fires? Because, I mean, now we're back to elements again, and fire is a very interesting element. It, it is, and it's actually a very big dreaming for our people because it's the dreaming of creation. Um, so um, the greatest source of fire is the sun, and she's a woman in, in Aboriginal mythology, um, sun woman. And um, so it, it is, again, once again, about the elements of fire um, that's there. There's something about sun woman that she teaches us about about fire. What is interesting is people here in Australia are saying, well, we need to return to indigenous practices of managing country by um, yes, the, yes. The, the burning, the traditional burn, burning, burnings and that, yeah. that we used to do. And now, you know, now that they're in so much um, trouble, they're now turning to our people and saying, yeah, we need to, we need to um, reinstigate these traditional practices. You know, look what it's done to the land. So on one hand, there's that appreciation for, oh my goodness, uh, the indigenous people have lived here for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, yeah, maybe we need to turn to them to uh, provide some of the answers. Um, um, and then on the other hand, you know, I listen to Max e um, Egan a lot, uh -huh. um, a lot of his shows, and, you know, <laughs> what he's saying about the fires is something else is going yeah, on. Yeah, Max has of... suffered a bit of a meltdown lately, but, you know, yeah. God bless him. He's a wonderful man. I've met him. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm listening to him at the same time and trying to keep my mind open about these things. But I think um, the answer probably lies somewhere in the middle, but they're definitely um, to do with the, the elements. It's, it's just been, it's almost like, it, um, I was just saying to my partner the, just yesterday, saying, you know, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm interested in a lot of religions and that. I said, but geez, this feels like the end days, you know, that people yeah. talk about. And Armageddon, and, and I, it's very real. And, of course, the fires are not very far away from us. They're about just an, an, an hour's drive away. Oh, wow. and, and so on our, on our doorstep, if you like, we're lucky we live on the coast by the sea so that we've got some sort of escape should anything happen. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're, 
they're just really throwing everybody. People are just at a loss to how to explain them. People have now got to rebuild their lives. And at one level, I think, well, now you know what our people have gone through when you came to, to this country and you know decimated our people in some areas. And um, perhaps that might just give you a little bit of sympathy and, and feelings of empathy for our people and what we've experienced. Um, but they're at a, at a, we're all just at a, a, at a total loss, really, in some ways of, of trying to explain. But the, the, the thing is, Randy, a lot of these fires, they're burning in ways that uh, people can't explain and unable to predict. Um, and and the, the other striking thing about the, them is that they're burning with this intensity that people have never known before, um, people that, that fight fires. I always think that you, you, that's an odd term, isn't it, firefighter? It's not something you <laughs> fight <laughs> because you can't fight with nature. You have to work with nature and, 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 and be and co-op, be more cooperative with nature rather than trying to fight her and um, because that's not going to get you anywhere. There's so many archetypes that come into play here with these fires. And there is the destructive element. And then we know that nature, there are natural fires, whether they're lightning strikes or spontaneous combustion. Mm -hmm. um, nature has this propensity to burn itself and through that burning process, then create space for generation of, of, of new life. And I've been in old growth forests, and mm -hmm. we've seen the, the forest fires here where I live. Um, our mountains here, are 700, 800 foot elevations. And I've seen forest fires, especially when I was a kid, there was a lot of them. And you're right, there's no controlling them. I mean, they have methods. The, the, strength, the, the most interesting method is actually to build a cordon of fire around a fire as a, a, as a break fire, if, you, if you're mm. familiar with that method of firefighting. Yes. And, yes. and so you fight fire with fire, but really you're not fighting it. You're simply using the element. There's so much about it that's symbolic in terms of this purification and the reduction back to the base elements of carbon and then the regeneration. I mean, I've walked through places where there were forest fires and looked at the embers, the, 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 the carbon on the ground and seen the buds, the sprigs coming up through the ash. Yeah, yeah, the new growth that, that comes uh, through. Um, so, yeah, there's something about that that isn't there where we... It, when you think of our own lives and that where we where some of us just completely break down completely that's like a fire within us and then there's something new emerges this the the rising of the phoenix from the ashes there's something quite archetypal about that um the, a message there for us um so it's almost like the earth um recreates itself and, and replenishes itself through fire so um and yeah then, we, and then on it, the heels of that fire you had those rains that came you know that's yes. that was really interesting as well yes in some some places they were worried that um it would wash away whole areas of land and and pollute the waters, go into the dams and and, and whatnot, the, and mudslides and the fear of that as well. So, just how yes, how that fire and that smoke goes up into the clouds and and creates the there's a special term I forget which it is scientific term to describe those new clouds that have born out of the, the um, out of fires. Um, that then produced the rains and so forth. So, yeah, so the elements of fire and water uh, working together. Um, that's, sometimes that's the message there somewhere. Yeah, there is sometimes opposing, but sometimes working with each other. Yeah. I don't let's see where we want to go here. Um, gosh, there's so much to unpack. Um, taking the shamanic practices to another level, 
how do you integrate shamanism, which is so poorly understood by the Western mindset, and I include myself in that. Um, I think the word's used a little too loosely, and it's disconnected from its roots. Um, how do you authenticate shamanism? How, because you have shaman and their practitioners. They're not, everybody is not a shaman. So how, right. how do we how do we acknowledge the authentic shaman from let's i hate to say it but you know mm -hmm. there are shaman who are frankly charlatans they're not shaman yes so yeah. how do we know the difference um that's a really interesting question um i think somewhere um what we you know I've, I've seen um a saying somewhere a meme where it says you know a powerful person when you look into their eyes uh, and, and you see, so um, I've had experiences that, um, that are out of this world, if you like, um, and and um, and when I talk to Aboriginal people, um, a lot of them have similar experiences. Um, I was, um, I remember being, um, uh, I'd met this young, uh, oh no, he wasn't so young, he was, I think he was close to my age, uh, Aboriginal man, and um, he just said to me, he said, you're a big one, aren't you? And I knew exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> so I think there's that ability of our people to see, one, who's genuine, who's not, um, who is a real shaman, who's a charlatan. So there's something about um, looking into the eyes of someone that's really, really powerful in that way and uses their shamanic powers to go to all sorts of worlds that you, you just know. Um, and of course, there are others who are blind to that, and would think that oh, he's just a silly old drunken old, old old man doesn't know what he's talking about, doesn't even realise the value of that person sitting there, and the journeys and the think places where they've had to go. I had one older Aboriginal woman at one time told tell me she said to me, Manya, you have no idea of what I do at night. She says I go down deep into the bowels of the earth and I have to clean up all of the crap that's down there but she said that's my job I accept that and that's what I do she said but people have no idea now of course other people listening to her think she's she's bonkers you know she's nuts she's crazy but um, this woman um, is someone I respect very well and I often have her come along to my dream time courses that I teach um, for her to share her knowledge and her wisdom. To me, she's the genuine thing. I believe she actually does that and goes down and cleans up um, the crap that's underneath and, and works in the sewers of, of the um, underbelly, if you like, and cleaning um, cleaning things out. So um, it's, it's, it's really just left to an individual person being able to sense who is, who is genuine and who isn't. Um, yeah. So a lot of dirty energy going on there, probably, right? Um, yes. Cleaning up the energetic and, yes. you know, discharge. I mean, yes. this, this goes into a whole other thing, and maybe we'll talk about this yeah. when we go into the second hour of the show. Mm -hmm. But this idea of cleaning and cleaning our energetic fields, um, I that's something that I still... I'm learning to do whether it's using um, salt baths or purification rituals, smudging things like that. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. have no idea the discharge energetically that goes on, and, and especially the dark energy that we're expelling. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have that similar smudging practice that Native Americans do. Um, we call it smoking um, because of the smokes that are created from the uh, special leaves that we put on the fires and that and and smoking is done all the time at um, all before ceremony to purify people so that um, they not don't bring these dark energies um, or negative energies into um, in, into a place and um, pollute pollute the place if you like so um, smoking is a very big thing in, in our culture so we're kind of winding up on on the first hour this went really yeah. fast um 
Let me give you a chance to talk a little bit about the book because yeah. I've, this book is really kind of a primer for people who want to immerse themselves in the concept of dream time. Talk a little bit about the book and, and then give out your information where people can find you in the books. Yeah, the book is called Journey into Dream Time because I do see it as a journey. And um, it, it is it explains um, some of the basic um, philosophies of dream time, for instance, because a lot of people here in Australia will say, oh, great, I'll get that book for my kids, um, thinking it's full of dream time stories. And, of course, there's not a dream time story in it. It really is to um, introduce basic religious concepts to people so that they can better understand the dream time. I'm having a really, um, people are responding to it very well. They're saying, gosh, it's one of the best explanations of dream time that I've come across. And um, I, I'm now beginning to understand um, where you're coming from as Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, but it's it's also it's about offering everybody around the world um, an opportunity or um, to learn about a spirituality that's so old and that all of us really um, know about at some very deep level. Um, um, a lot of us have had similar experiences to this. So um, it's available through um, Amazon Books, but also uh, from our website, um, which is www.evolve, uh, with an S, evolves.com.au and people can go onto our website and look under uh, products and they'll see uh, the Dreamtime book. They can purchase it online uh, and we send out to um, anyone anywhere in the world. You do. You even send it to me here in <laughs> the United States. Um, you also mentioned earlier you did a, a, a book, The Seven Sisters of the Pleiades. Yes. Oh, that sounds interesting. Is that yes. available as well? That's available as well. It's published by Spinifex Press. Uh, it was published in 2004, and that's available also through Amazon Books as well. And with that, um, we call that the Seven Sisters Dreaming. And so I looked at the Seven Sisters Dreaming, uh, which meant I looked at myths from all over the world. So each chapter is on a different country's interpretation or different cultures interpretation of the seven sisters so there's a um for instance there's a chapter on native american beliefs around the pleiades particularly um about devil's tower where, mm -hmm. that, that I visited in wyoming that has a, a fascinating story there about the seven young indian boys that climbed up um, this tree and were chased by a bear and it uh, turned into, grew into the sky tall like a tree and turned into a mountain. I also um, look at the Pleiades in ancient Egypt. Nobody in the world, as far as I know, has written on the Pleiades in, in ancient uh, Egypt. And I've looked at um, the mythology in Japan. Um, they call Subaru there. Mm -hmm. after, uh, yep. car. And um, so what I've done with that book is also look to the commonalities in all of the themes. And they're really quite interesting, Randy, because um, they, they, it doesn't matter where you travel in the world, the themes are, st are still there. There's usually, there's always about seven young women with some exceptions, like the Native American uh, myths that are about seven young boys. But they, again, they're not men. They're, they're almost like in that world caught in between, between. between from yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And um, there, um, there's always something, there's always a younger one that's lost. There's a lost sister and the other sisters are involved with trying to find her. There's a water connection, very interesting. Of course there is. <laughs> in, all of, in all of the stories, um, the, the, the women are connected with water um, from the Greek mythology um, right through to Aboriginal culture where they're described as being water girls. Um, so very strong water connection. There's a connection, quite curiously, with honey. And so one of the Greek sisters, for instance, um, I think it's Merope, um, her name means bee eater, uh, honey eater. Wow. And uh, so there's a honey connection, and I trace that too. It's interesting that in the book of Job... Yes, I was thinking about, of that when you the, said that. 
the sweet influence of the mm-hmm. Pleiades, you know. And so I explore what that could possibly mean. And um, all of those, I look at all of those common themes and I say, isn't it just kind of curious that for a small, tiny cluster of stars that's barely visible to the naked eye, um, that so much of the world has all of the same stories, whether you're in South America or Europe or in the Pacific uh, or, or wherever, that all of the stories are very similar and common. So it's an interesting read for people. Excellent. We'll put some links up with this show when, when we put it out so people can find that material. That could be a whole other conversation maybe we'll have. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to flip this over. We're going to go into the second segment of our interview, our talk, our discussion. I hate the word interview anymore. It's not an interview. It's a conversation. <laughs> yes. And so uh, we'll do we'll do the other side of this. We usually uncork the woo-woo jar at that point and go a little deeper. That's off planet. That's um, patreon.com forward slash off planet media. If you want to do that, not a lot of money. You can subscribe to us there. And for those of you on the public side, uh, you've been with uh, Munya Andrews and myself. And uh, this is Off Planet Radio. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And if you join us on the other side, you can get some more. See you the next time. This is Off Planet Radio.